I suppose the Irish Icelandic connection is really during the Viking period and then there isn't any connection from the Middle Ages on. I mean, very sporadic. Certainly, you know, even when I went to Iceland in 1979, you kind of would have been hard pressed to find another Irish person who had recently been there. And that's Eilish Nguivna, an acclaimed writer of fiction and drama in both English and Irish. Now, she's a long association with University College Dublin, and her late husband, Boo Almquist, was the well-respected Swedish folklorist who made such a contribution to research and writing on the connections between Ireland and Icelandic folklore. I'm Helen Shaw, and this is Mother's Blood, Sister's Songs, the story of how the genetics of Iceland reveals its Gaelic female roots. So I sat down with Eilish in her home near Glasnevin in Dublin to talk about those connections and her own relationship to Iceland, a place she's been visiting on and off since the 1970s when she first went there and where her husband was once based as an academic. My name is Eilish Nigwivna, or Eilish Nigwivna Almquist. I'm a writer of fiction, uh, mainly non-fiction and other forms as well. And I'm also a folklorist, uh, have a PhD in comparative folklore. I'm president of the Folklore of Ireland Society, and uh, I teach a bit in folklore and creative writing. So, you know, we're doing this project, obviously, around Ireland and Iceland. And before we even talk about your work or in many ways, the academic thinking or threads around folklore between both places, I'm really curious because you're one of those people who went to Iceland in the 70s. I first went to Iceland 40 years ago in 1979 in the summer. I went with my to be husband, Boo Almquist, who loved Iceland and spoke Icelandic fluently and was an Icelandic and Celtic scholar. I spent three weeks in mostly in Reykjavik in that summer, July 1979. I went from Denmark, which was is a kind of traditional way to go to Iceland. It was beautiful. Uh, very quiet. It was quite an exotic location to visit in those days. There weren't that many tourists. It wasn't all that easy to get there. That was my first impression, um, Reykjavik as, as a quiet town. I kind of remember that it seemed hard to get a meal in a restaurant if you were trying to eat after about eight o'clock at night or that sort of thing. And we we travelled over Springy Sander through the middle of Iceland, over the desert to Arcareri up in the north. So I got to see quite a lot of Iceland on that occasion. I've gone back a few times, but most recently, about two or three years ago, and Reykjavik had changed exponentially. It's now become such a huge tourist destination. I went in March and it was already packed with people and there were loads of cafes and restaurants and everything. It's changed hugely in that respect. And maybe just a little bit about your late husband, Bo, as well, because in some ways, like every time anyone researches around this area, you come up against his name and his work and his reputation. As one of my children is reputed to have said when they were about four or five and they were in one of these competitions with other kids boasting about their fathers, he said, my father is famous in Iceland. (laughs) I don't know if that's entirely true, but Boo was very learned. Um, He was an expert on Icelandic uh, folklore and medieval literature and culture and also on Irish folklore. He was a professor of Irish folklore in UCD, but he had more or less perfect Icelandic and also perfect Irish. So he was in a very good position for investigating the connections between Icelandic and Celtic culture. And he devoted a lot of time and wrote a lot about these connections. Boo had a fantastic memory, I think. He seemed to remember everything that he read. I've been listening to uh, interviews he did with 
past pupil of his Anne O'Connor um, recently and he describes the first time he met an Irish storyteller, Michal O'Gaheen, who was a great storyteller in John Quinn and Kerry and son of the well-known Peg Sayers. But the first time Boo met Michal, which was in the summer of 1957 in John Quinn, a very long time ago, Michal told him a big, long story, which he said he had difficulty understanding because his Irish was not uh, great at that time. But he included a proverb, it's not the same thing going into the house of the king as coming out of it kind of cute. I've been thinking about that in connection with Brexit I kind of think now I know what that line means it's easier to go in to, than, than to go out but Boo says uh, kind of offhandedly this immediately reminded me of a line in Egil's saga and the same line is there in this Icelandic saga and he said people by which he means scholars had thought this might be a proverb in Egil Saga in Icelandic but they hadn't come across any other versions of it and you can't find anything as a proverb unless there are several versions that's what a proverb means really but here it was in Kerry in 1957 and in the medieval Egil Saga and Boo was the one who could recognize that straight away so that was Boo he could see he could see the connections because he knew the stuff Mm-hmm. I love that idea of the story because, yes, it, it's hearing a living echo because you know the manuscripts and the work so well and you speak the languages. Um, yeah, well, Boo wrote many articles, some of which are collected in anthologies or, or books, such as the one called The Viking Ale or um, there's another one called Northern Lights, about these connections between um, Iceland and Ireland as demonstrated in the folklore of both countries and also in kind of links between parallels in Irish folklore that you find uh, represented in Icelandic sagas. One of the first he wrote when he came here because he heard the story is about his little comic story or joke called The Uglier Foot. And he found examples of this in Irish uh, oral tradition as collected in the archives of the National Folklore Collection in UCD. But also he found a cartoon in a, in a newspaper or in a magazine which um, was about this story. Uh, very simply, there's a man who's, I think, asleep in bed and one of his feet is sticking out. And his friend says, I never saw an uglier foot than that. And let's call the man Sean. Sean says well, I bet you I can find an uglier one for you. And they make the bet. And then Sean produces his other foot. And that's even uglier for some reason. Now, this is just a little joke, but it occurs in the great Icelandic historian Snorri Sturlson, um, Heimskringla, exactly the same story. And actually in the Snorri version, the other foot is uglier because one of the toes is missing. The big toe actually must have made it hard for the man who's called Thor in, in that version to, to, to walk. That would seem to be an example of a little story that travelled from Ireland to Iceland in the Middle Ages. And um, he didn't like wide sweeping theories, but I suppose in the end, the sweeping theory is that there are connections between Iceland and Ireland culturally, and he could demonstrate this. He was very insistent on having evidence for everything. And you you mentioned before that obviously Gisli Sigurdsson and, and he would have been research colleagues and would have been collaborative at times, but that he would have differed somewhat from Gisley's maybe 1980s thesis, which really makes a very strong and embedded connection between Gaelic culture and Icelandic. Gisley was actually Boo's student in the 1980s and um, my memory of it is that Boo thought uh, Gisley had overstated the connection a bit. They were very good friends and colleagues. Um, he still is a friend of mine. It certainly wasn't an acrimonious debate, but I mean, Gisley was a young guy. <laughs> Boo differed from most of his students. <laughs> um, so uh, it was that sort, that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, I think it is true to say that he thought that perhaps Gisley had, you know, was carried away a bit by his desire to see these connections. As I've often thought, the Icelanders have always been much more 
interested uh, in and uh, aware of this Irish Icelandic connection than Irish people in general are. I mean, in general, Irish people don't know about it at all, I guess. But um, I, I think he thought Gisli was being a bit emotional about about some of it. And um, as you say, uh, Gisli's theories now seem to have been proven by the DNA. He sent me his thesis, which he did an updated forward, I think, in 2003, when the first genetic wave was published in, in terms of the DNA. Well, I suppose Iceland geographically is about the same size as Ireland, I suppose, but the population is so small and it is so homogenous. I, I, I mean, now we have the medieval Irish connection, but in a way it's been a small group um, people in the past lived scattered around on farms, isolated farms throughout the kind of inhabitable parts of the country. So I think it's been easier for them to, you know, keep track of their origins and so on. Also, Icelanders, there's so many differences between them uh, and the Irish. And one is that they're very literate people. And, you know, that's adduced as one of the reasons why the language has not changed very much from Old Norse to modern Icelandic. And also that Boo says there are not very many dialects, uh, local dialects in Iceland. What you get in most countries here, or England, whatever, you don't have the thing where Donegal Irish, Kerry Irish, Galway Irish or there are big differences in the way they're pronounced and in some of the vocabulary and so on, whereas Iceland is a more homogenous and unified society. They're very proud people. I mean, we kind of think we're proud, but it's, it's, it's more mixed, you know. They're proud to be Icelanders. One of my favourite novels, Independent People, I think that's how Icelanders see themselves. It's a cultural identity which has almost been honed by literature by books that the sagas create this embodiment so they're written into an identity Mm. and they carry that Mm. very clearly and then almost you sort of see that echoed in something contemporary like independent people Mm. you see this as a profound act of storytelling where you create Mm. a nation from scratch Mm. through story embedded in truth as well as in imagination yeah iceland is a very literary nation also a great storytelling nation, the storytelling being in the oral tradition, not written down. But I think that maybe is a because we're a very literary nation as well. We really do have this unusually rich storytelling tradition. I think it sounds like a cliche and something that the tourist board would be putting out. But the evidence seems to be there that, in fact, there has been more storytelling going on in Ireland than in many other places and equally so in Iceland. So maybe that is something that we have given to them. And that's almost where Gisley's, since he shared his masters, was that that's his opening line. It's like, you know, his point of discovery was like, why did they write it? The idea being he starts that by sort of saying we connect on the literary. That was what started his work, which was obviously Mm. under the eye, the guidance of your, your late husband. It's clear that there are references to Ireland in the sagas. For instance, um, in the most famous of all the sagas, Njal's saga, we have detailed reference to the Battle of Clontarf. In um, the most poignant and charming reference is, of course, Mael Corca in Laxdala saga. Mael Corca is taken to Iceland as a slave and in the saga she doesn't talk. They think she's mute, that she cannot talk. Then one day somebody overhears her talking to her little boy, Oliver, the same name as my son, actually, Olive, and she's speaking Irish to him. So we have these um, references to Irish language and Irish culture in the sagas, which indicate a connection. I know there are these theories about kind of the structuring and so on, which have some references to ancient Irish literature. I'm not an expert on the saga, but one big difference between medieval Irish literature and the sagas is that the sagas are so much more economical, tight and more like, um, in a way, 19th century novels are that. Whereas the, uh, you know, the Thon, our great epic, 
is referred to by Frank O'Connor as that crumbling cathedral of <laughs> a, te- a text. And it, it is kind of all over the place, whereas the Icelandic stuff is more Scandinavian, more economical in every way. Understatement is a big feature of the Icelandic sagas. And actually, the Icelandic sense of humour, even to this day, they do share with us a sense of humour, but theirs is very understated, whereas the Irish medieval literature is totally over the top. I mean, it's like James Joyce versus Beckett. That's how I see the Icelandic sagas versus the medieval Irish literature. That's that's my view of it. Since, you know, since we're, we're talking about that, I mean, like in some ways, talk about your own work and how you use folk stories, whatever word we want to use, legend, mythology, folk Mm -hmm. story in both your own work and also how you've drawn on Icelandic as well. Well, um, I write fiction about modern times, stories, contemporary women, mostly in Ireland, mostly. But I suppose an aspect of my style or of my technique is that I sometimes counterpoint uh, an old story from folk tradition with a new story that I have made up myself. So I've done that a few times, at least. The very first time I did it, which was in the 1980s, I was kind of inspired by the Kerry Babies case, the Joanna Hayes thing. At that time, I used a legend called Midwife to the Fairies. And this is a legend which is was quite common in Ireland and is also, according to Boo, the most common legend in Iceland. It's a really interesting little story. I interpreted it as being about um, births which are supposed to be kept secret and that nobody is supposed to talk about it. In the legend, the bones of the story are that a midwife, one of the women in the community who performs this function, somebody knocks on her door one night and asks her to come and help at a birth. And it is, uh, she must always do this if asked. And in the Irish versions, he brings her into the fairy fort. The mountain opens and they go in. Uh, She assists at the childbirth. The child is born. It's a fairy woman who's having the baby. And then she is brought home again. But while she's in the fort, she inadvertently touches her eye with a bit of fairy ointment or even water. Anyway, a few days later, she's at the fair in her local village and she sees the man, the fairy man and some of his pals going around the fair. She goes up to him and she asks, as you would, how's, you know, how are they getting on the baby and the mammy? And he says, which eye do you see me with? And she says, I see you with my right eye. And he raises his stick and he puts out her eye. That's the end of the story. And um, I sort of counterpointed it with a story about a modern childbirth, which wasn't to be spoken about and which was to be kept secret. And I interpreted the legend that it is a sort of coded way of talking in the community about these births. You know, the birth happens in a fairy fort. okay. but in fact, in the community, there were probably, as we know, um, because of the stigma attached to um, having children out of wedlock and all the rest, there were many childbirths which the midwife was was supposed to shut up about and I think that's one way of interpreting the legend so that was my first time doing that and I've done it on subsequent occasions as well and I found a story which has a line a story written by me that I'd kind of forgotten about which is called How Lovely the Slopes Are that is actually a wonderful beautiful line from Njal's saga and I'll just read it here the character in the story is saying more lines from Njal's saga visit her mind spontaneously and unbidden as is the habit of proverbs and saws or any of the old scraps of wisdom we have heard and which whirl invisibly in the air around us all the time choosing their own moment to descend to our consciousness like angels bearing feather like gifts of truth they rode down to the marker river on their way to the ship Gunnar's horse stumbled and he had to dismount. He glanced up the hill to his home. How lovely the slopes are, he said. More lovely than they have ever appeared to me before. Golden cornfields and new mown hay. I'm going back home and I will not go away. So in Njal's saga, Gunnar um, 
who's fleeing from the law. He's going to be killed if he stays in Iceland. On his way down to the ship, he looks back at Leader Andy, the farm, and it just looks so beautiful that he can't bring himself to leave. And he stays in Iceland. And that's one of the tragedies of Njol Saga. It's such a, a beautiful little scene, I think. So that's one that I held in my mind and that yeah, I use it in connection with a woman who's um, considering leaving a marriage and then looks back and changes her mind. It's fascinating because the, the title even of Njol Saga is yes. Nile. Nile, yeah, yeah. There is that sense and you can hear the, the echo of that, that conversation from the 80s that one can get carried away with connections within it and where a connection begins and ends. You've used the Melkorka story yourself. The Melkorka story, and maybe we've always thought it was a story, um, almost like a fairy tale, does have an affinity with us because it, it touches all those aspects mm-hmm. of, of a slave princess. And I'm just wondering about your own maybe experience going there as an Irish woman. I have got to know many Icelanders over the years, over 40 years, from visiting Iceland and through knowing Icelanders who come here because there seem to always be some Icelandic students in UCD um, over the past 40 years. And we used to always, you know, they would come and have dinner with us and visit us sometimes quite regularly, some people over the years. So I, I've got to know Icelanders very well and I like them very much for their generosity. I think they do share a sort of flahulux um, with us, a tradition of that, but especially for their kind of low key and sharp sense of humour and um, for their intelligence. But I can't say that I felt an affinity with them, but maybe I was influenced by my perception that it, you know, Iceland was known as a country and people who were very pure, very pure Scandinavian, kind of not um, affected by interracial marriages or anything like that, that they had always sort of been just Norse and Icelandic. So now we know there is the Irish thing. But I I like them. They're my pals. But I never felt that I was an Icelander. (laughs) And I'm wondering if you sense about like the role of poetry in both places. The role of the poet, it was very important in Bardic Ireland, ancient Ireland, and it's very important in Iceland. In fact, Boo's uh, doctoral thesis was on Icelandic poetry, nor in a need need dicting a particular kind of um, Icelandic poetry, which was believed to be very powerful. This was a sort of poem which was a curse. The poets could compose extemporized. They could just compose on the foot without writing anything down or whatever. And they had to do this kind of poetry in that way. And that poetry had the power to kill somebody, to kill an animal. And uh, in Ireland, as Dohio Hogan in his big book on Phila points out, the Irish poets had powers of that kind as well. Not exactly the same, but were not just important, but had magical powers. Yeah. So there's that also in common, yeah. The idea that poems and magic are still powerful still exists in Iceland. And that was evident during the recent economic recession when they were, like us, very angry with the bankers and with with what happened. And in protests in Reykjavik, they used some of this um, need dickening stuff in their protests. They carried kind of phallic symbols and they cursed the bankers. So it's much more alive there than it is here. I suppose the Irish Icelandic connection is really during the Viking period. And then there isn't any connection from the Middle Ages on. I don't think so. I mean, very sporadic. Certainly, you know, even when I went to Iceland in 1979, you kind of would have been hard pressed to find another Irish person who had recently been there. I was just going to ask you one final thing, which kind of relates to what we were talking about with magic, which was that there's a lot of discussion about the connections and the relationship between the supernatural, you might call it, mm. say like the she people. Mm. Like so, you know, sometimes there's a lot of focus with with Iceland, with the hidden people, mm-hmm. the Hultfolk mm-hmm. and our traditions around, mm. you know, fairies, leprechauns. But 
it seems much more interesting when you look at that idea of which is what you were referencing there about about curses and magic about you know the she that there's maybe a resonance that that aspect of a spiritual world which which is both dark mm. and and fully present the belief in uh, the little people the fairy folk in Ireland was extremely strong until relatively recently and it seems to be still quite strong um, in Iceland all ordinary people just took it for granted that there was another community um, living alongside them and invisible and um, and it, it does seem to be pretty much the same in Iceland and the, and Icelanders claim that they still believe in them though few Irish people I think would go that far although we still have this uh, thing which folklorists call half belief so you don't believe in the fairies but on the other hand you won't do anything to annoy them just in case so you know so we have the fairy trees and the fairy mounds and so on that farmers would be reluctant to interfere with you know I think that does seem to be something that we have in common with the Icelanders. Is it to do with the kind of, you know, the farming communities, the kind of very rural society and so on? The dark, in the case of Iceland, the sort of sense of people being pitted against nature to a much greater extent over there than they are here. But, you know, it's still the case here that there's so much over which you don't have control so you believe in in other people because the fairies in Ireland are largely male- malevolent they're not nice people <laughs> they're mostly out to get you but you have to be on your guard not to um, annoy them by building on their paths or cutting down their trees or upsetting them in any way it's almost it seems like a belief which is attached to kind of having a, a, a respect for the mysteriousness of nature and I think you get that in Iceland as well. That's what strikes me with, with uh, you know, sometimes this this may be infantile world that we, where we now treat fairies as being cute and, and that like, but actually our tradition is about changelings like the fairies would take your child. We had spirits like the puka, you know, you've 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 yeah. Ashleen's because I remember even, you know, like in my own family, when you do the tree, you see the boys, mm. the boy children dressed for mm. the christening mm. with the christening robes. And the older women would have said mm. that was also to stop the fairies taking them, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that you have that sense that like maybe also it's a culture where if you think about it up until 100 years ago, the chances of surviving a true birth or mm. through childbirth. But for mm. the child, like like infant mortality, mm-hmm. like you do kind of think it's also that close proximity of death mm. that this is also like what's embedded in yeah. harsher culture yes um it was dangerous um to be alive almost in the past in ireland and high rates of infant mortality and drowning and all kinds of things so um i suppose you have measures particularly in connection with the whole belief that fairies would snatch a child measures taken to try and protect children like the belief that iron was uh, an antidote to the fairy so they might push stick a needle somewhere in the bedclothes on the cradle or even put a poker across the cradle to to ward off the fairies i mean you could interpret that as being fear of death or illness or whatever the changeling legend is uh, very uh, sort of negative uh, one you know an interpretation of that is that um, it was used by people to explain away um, children who might have had spina bifida or some sort of um, condition with which they were actually just unable to cope in the in the traditional community. So they say this is a changeling and um, it's the real child has been taken by the fairies and then you don't have to care for the changeling. And we have the awful stories about um how they tested uh, they are stories but sometimes uh, fiction became fact how they would test uh, somebody who was believed to be a changeling by putting them in the fire or something and that's it like yeah, that's the end or expose putting them out exposing them so there are those kind of um, very negative aspects of the fairy faith This is an aside now. I love Icelanders. Partly they're very Scandinavian in their way of approaching things. But you know, 
it's a kind of law in Iceland that every child will learn to swim. And in every little village in Iceland, there's a swimming pool. So they can learn to swim. And that's to prevent drownings, because drownings were very common in Iceland, as in Ireland in the past, in the fishing communities and so on. But now they have taken action. Every Icelandic child learns to swim. And they don't just legislate for it. I think that might be the difference. They give them the pools <laughs> so um, they, can, they can do it. That's Eilish Nguivna Anquist talking to me about Ireland, Iceland, what connects us and what defines us. Now, I've added some links in the text box of the podcast to both Eilish's own work and to the UCD Ireland Iceland project, where Eilish took part in an event last year, bringing together writers and academics from both places. Thanks for listening. <laughs>